Texas Radio Mystery Theater presents... definition, a yellow metallic element, malleable and impervious to rust. Symbol, A-U. Atomic weight, 196.967. Specific gravity, 19.3 at 20 degrees centigrade. By other definition, because of its scarcity and resistance to corrosion, the most precious and desirable metal in the world and also the most corrupting. Since time immemorial, men have sought it as the highest boon. For the same length of time, they have found it can be the most dread of curses. If there is gold there, I'll tie off a line and send up the balloon float. I may need an acetylene torch. Speaking of torches, you'll need a submarine lamp. Yes. Oh, come on, Chase. Don't look so gloomy. I am not gloomy. I'm scared. I'm scared to death. Of what? I don't know, him. I wish I did. Don't be silly. Give me my diamond helmet. And take a good look at me. This may be the last time you'll see me. What do you mean? The next time, I'll be a new man with my pockets lined with gold. I know Lady Luck has finally blessed me. Or could you? Our mystery drama, Fool's Gold, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin. It stars Mason Adams and Terry Keene. I'll be back shortly with Act One. search for buried treasure always has the lure of romance. It's very easy to forget that underneath the urge to find it is buried one of man's oldest sins, the sin of greed, for which, no matter how large a store of gold he may amass, by the terms of Christian ethic, he must finally pay the price. All of which is the story of Hank Levitt. Thank you, Stuart. There's your martini, Jake. I didn't order a drink. I did. For both of us. Celebration. Not the way I see it. Oh, come on. Jake, let's knock it off. We're on our way to the greatest adventure in our lives. If it pays off, forget the lean years. You and me, we're going to be richer than King Mike. For me, the greatest adventure of our lives was meeting and falling in love. So you can't be rich and in love, too? Up and think what this could mean to us. Frank, that's what I'm asking you to do. Well, what's the thing? A year of bone-breaking, mind-boggling research was worth it to turn up the chart. Was it? Was it worth turning over all those stones and the things that crawled out? Was it worth the money and the risk and all that time apart? I couldn't take you with me, Chicks. I wouldn't have taken the risk of exposing you to that kind of danger. Well, maybe I'd rather have that risk than the other. What other? the risk of losing you. <laughs> no sweat there. I know how to take care of myself. I wasn't thinking about you. I was thinking about me. You lost me somewhere. Did I, Hank? That's just what I'm afraid of. I met Hank Levitt my first summer on the Florida Keys. I was 19 and scuba diving was the big new thrill. I had plenty of boys who wanted to teach me, but that's just what they became after I met Hank. He was one hunk of man. Tall, dark as I was, fair. Rippling with lean muscle, looking just as young as any of the boys. Though he must have been well into his thirties by then. And he'd forgotten more about existing under the sea than any of us would ever learn. I slipped over him, as he did with me. And a year later, we were married. He wasn't rich but my parents approved because he was distinguished. 
a well-known marine biologist and oceanographer. After I dive, just keep circling slowly. Now, if I locate it, I'll send up a marker balloon. How deep are you going? Less than 20 fathoms. But if it's been moved by the current into a valley, it could be almost twice as much. You shouldn't be going down alone. Can't I come along? It's a bit rugged for you, hon. Anyway, somebody's got to mind the door. Well, then let's go back into the Tobago's and get somebody to run the boat or dive with you. Are you kidding? You think I'm going to let anyone else in on this? Every treasure buff in the business is looking for the Maurice Sanglade. I'm not letting anyone else in on it. Why not? You know what the estimates are on the gold alone that she was carrying? Whatever they were or are, they're not worth your life. Thirteen to fifty million, a hundred at today's price. And how much am I worth? Hey, would you check my my tank strap? I think one of them is buckled. Well, what did you say? I said. How much am I worth? Oh, come on, Jinx. It's just sour grapes because you're not diving with me. Break it down with a gun. I'm going over. It was so Because what had started out as an incredibly romantic thrill, the sharing of a whole new world with the man I loved, the exotic, strange, enchanted forest of the seabed and its secrets, had very soon faded from dream to nightmare. Hank didn't scuba dive for pleasure or to further his studies of marine life. He was a man with an obsession, hooked like a gambler on making that great discovery, uncover that fabled hoard of pirate treasure. And far more than me, he was married to another woman, the Marie Sangon, a ship which sailed into mysterious oblivion along with her master, Captain Lafitte. Over a hundred and fifty years ago, hauled down in the water from a cargo of buccaneers' gold. A cargo that after twelve years of marriage, we were still searching for beneath the ocean. Jason! I'm here, Hank. Well, what are you doing with the blinds drawn? The heat really knocked me out, and I, I just couldn't stand the glare of the sun anymore. I have great news! I've got a boat all set up, and a man I can trust. Since I got his name from old Pudge Gentry back at the Keys. And tomorrow, we're going to prove out this chart and start on our way to scooping up enough money to own more of the world than we'll ever need. Oh, Hank, I already have all of it I need. If only I had you to go along with it. Come on, darling, let's not start quarreling. All I want to do is stop it. Great, great, then let's, let's. Look, we're on the verge of finding what we've been looking for all these years. What you have been looking for, Hank. Not me. Oh, Hank. I've been after such a simple treasure. But you haven't allowed me to find it. What do you mean? A child. Children. Oh, there's plenty of time for that. Is there? I'm not 19 anymore, you know. I'm 31. I don't know. So what does that make you, Hank? Oh, I know that you don't look it. But if we had a child right now, you'd be deep into your 50s before he, he was... Or she was... 10 bit late, isn't it? Hmm. Not too late. Maybe. We got started right away. Well, we will. Just as soon as oh, we... just as soon as... How often have I heard that? The Marie Sunglass, that damn ship has come first in your life in all the years we've been married. The one we've chased all over the Gulf and the Caribbean. You always turned out to be an illusion. Not this time. I have a chart. I know exactly where she went down. A hundred and fifty years ago. You should know better than anyone that shifting tides or currents could have moved her miles from that position. And Hank, even if you find her, how are you going to raise the capital to salvage I'll her? get it. At the cost of another few years of our life? Is it worth it, Hank? I have a heart, Jinx. You can't deny me one last chance. No, I suppose not. I just wish I weren't haunted by the uneasy feeling that that's just what it is. Meeting Jean-Michel did little to calm my apprehensions. He was fat and oily, unkempt, and looked fairly dishonest. One thing I had to admit, he did know how to handle boats. We headed northwest from the main island, and within the hour, the small island of Montiel came up over the horizon. 
pulled him dangerously close to its coral cliff, then pointed due south and moved on a carefully measured course. We are coming up on two knots from shore, monsieur. Fine, plot it down a little, but keep plenty of way on it. And the edging? That is, she goes. Let me know when she marks two knots. Yes, here, monsieur. James. Yes, sir. Get the lead over and see what we're drawing. Right, sir. I'll get the first marker boy ready. You need a hand with that, monsieur? Oh, no, just keep your eye open for two knots. That's all. You got a reading yet, James? That's pretty deep. I stayed out nearly 21 fathoms. We are two miles from the island. Cut the engine. Let it drip. I have a mark tag, 25 fathoms. Good. There's close marker number one. Okay, Michelle, keep the same heading. We're going to box off an area half a mile square. Lever up. We dropped the four marker boys. We scooped over the rest of the day. We didn't cover as much of the area as Hank would have liked because the bottom began to shelve off a little deeper than I like to dive. And Hank had to spend a good deal of time coming up to the surface for tanks. Grab the tank, will you, Michelle? We must help. No luck? Uh-uh. You're going... You're not going down again. No, I bought it for today. You want me to up and come, Mr. Levitt? What for? Uh, you're not going to dive again today? No, but it's pretty far back to the main island, so we might as well stay more here. Save us a lot of time in the morning not having to mark the spot where we left off. <laughs> you don't mind, darling? Not any more than I mind the whole thing. Are we going to start that again? Look, the chart makes all kinds of sense. We know the features dropped out of sight in 1825. A part of what I bought is some pages from the log on his last voyage. He was headed for that little island over there. Yes, I know. But he called Monastil. My refuge. Yeah, he never made it. We know that from records on the main island. Nobody has ever lived on that island except Gulls and Ospreys. Somewhere under us in the half mile square of the ocean is the Marie Tanglant and all its its cargo. You sure will pardon me? Sure, Monsieur White. Is this in your mind to spend the night here, of Marathil, in this place? Yeah, that's the idea. And you think that we are, uh, in a way of speaking, riding at anchor over the grave of jean Lafitte's ship, the Marie Sanglon? Why, I... You know of the ship, Michel? And Lafitte? <laughs> in these parts, who does not know of the great Lafitte? And all the gold and jewels and pirate treasure he was bringing back to Monacil. But the treasure is long gone. If it exists, only the birds know where it lies. You mean he got everything to the island? Mm -hmm. Long ago, the island has been searched in every nook and cranny. Nothing was ever found. The legend is that he never lived to enjoy this fabulous world. Why not? Are you not the one with the chart and the knowledge, monsieur? Les anciens say that he came back on his last trip with so much gold that it overflowed from the holes and was piled waist high on the deck. But the ship was riding so low in the water that somewhere his keel caught on the rocks and he sank with all his crew before he could make his refuge. Everyone knows this? Every one of the sea believes it. But with all the years, nobody has ever known just where or had the equipment to find the ship. <laughs> Perhaps you think you can, eh? Have you no chance? But this boat, in any waters between the main island and Monacil, will not spend the night afloat. What do you mean? I am enchanted to bring you out with the first light tomorrow, but with the coming of dark, I make for harbor. Why? Because, madame, the night seas belong to Jean Lafitte. Every night, through the mists, his ghost ship still tries to run that last voyage for safety. Sometimes, on moonlight nights, you can see that old barkantine headed for Monacil. 
on, on the grave. And they say that if you see that ghost ship, you join it on the way to death. Shades of the Flying Dutchman of Legend, that restless ship doomed to roam the seven seas forever. For some crime too great for any universal being to forgive. What was Jean Lafitte's special crime? Just his life? Or his excessive love for plunder? Or is this just another tall tale of the sea? I shall return shortly with Act Two. Jean Lafitte. He was a privateer and a smuggler, a double agent between the British and the Americans. He fought on the American side in the Battle of New Orleans, and after the War of 1812, returned to piracy and roaming the Spanish Main. In 1825, he disappeared and was never heard of again. But 150 years later, at least in the small section of the South Caribbean where Hank Levitt is now hunting for his gold, his ghost still haunts the sea. And who knows, perhaps his ill-gotten gold still lies beneath them to be harvested. I know that ship is there. I know the gold is there. All right. Suppose it is. Then what? Don't you want to be rich? Not particularly. And even if we can organize a salvage company and not get stolen blind and get it up, it's still nothing I'd like to dirty my hands Now, with. what the Sam Hill does that mean? Hank, it's dirty gold. It's stained with blood, innocent blood. And the crimes of vicious men. Why do you want money like that? The gold isn't responsible. It's how a man tries to earn it. There's nothing dishonest or wrong about what I'm trying to do. No matter what you say, no matter how many years it has spent in the ocean, nothing will wash it clean. It can only cause trouble and violence and... Heaven knows what much worse if you keep after it. How? For one thing, I don't trust Michelle. Why? Because he's superstitious? Because he refused to spend a night out there in the water? Afraid of a man in the ship that must have <laughs> some bones by now? I don't know about that. It, 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 it's just something else. What? I don't trust him. Oh, forget how he looks. He's a friend of Pudge's. It's all the recognition I need to know he's honest and can be trusted. Not where gold is concerned. Hank, please, don't you see? If it's there, he already knows where to look as well as you do. What I'm afraid of is it wasn't superstition that drove him back here to the main island. Well, what else would it be? Well, he could maybe be getting some more men to hide somewhere on the boat so that if, if you should find the sunken ship tomorrow, they could... Oh, come on, Jane. I, I don't, I, I'm just scared. Just plain scared. I'm asking you one last time to drop the whole thing. You've got to be kidding. Just when I'm about to get my hands on a fortune. Now, look. Lay off, things. If you want to walk out of me, go ahead. But nothing, nothing is going to keep me from searching for that gold till I find it. So there it was at last. Out in the open. The end of Hank and me. The open admission that I would always be second in his life. He had gold fever. And I knew that nothing would stand in his way to satisfy his raging thirst for the metal whose yellow glow cast an enchanted spell that eventually destroyed. I should have walked out then. But I didn't. Habit. Love. Or just this gnawing reaction that the man who was still my husband was in deadly danger of his life. I didn't know, so I stayed. While Michelle is below decks, in case you'd like to know, I searched the boat from stem to gudgeon, and there's just a three of us aboard. I'm glad to hear it. But it doesn't set your mind at rest? Do you want me to be honest? No, thanks. I can do without it. Hey. No, but as long as you're here, can I count on your help? Of course. But not willingly. I'm thinking of you. Don't. I'm doing just what I want. When I find that gold, maybe you'll change your mind. You are what? sure the gold is there, Monsieur? I didn't know you'd come topside. Here, you, uh, you take the wheel, Michelle. Sure, 
Yes, I'm sure the cold is here. I agree with you, monsieur. Why? Because the ghost of the ship haunts these waters. For why? Because I think it tries to guard the ghost. If you're so afraid of this ghost ship, why do you help my husband look for it? Uh -huh. Not for it, madame, for the real ship. I think perhaps if that is ever found, the ghost ship would go away. I thought you were deathly afraid of it. Only by night, not by day. It never sails by day. Oh, you're all crazy. If old Captain Lafitte has kept you all from finding it for 150 years, it will never be found. This time, I think maybe it will. Why, monsieur? Because of your chart. What? What do you know about the chart? Only one thing. If it is right, we have all been looking in the wrong place. You mean the other side of the island, Monarchy? Exactly, monsieur. Where did you get this map? I bought it from a dying man. Who was the name of the man Philippe Turner? Yes. You know him? Yes. <laughs> I knew him once. In the Far East, in the war. He was the last descendant of Barbiros the Turner. Lafitte's first mate. Just a moment, monsieur. I always suspected he knew where the ship was sunk. But we are arrived. Do you start again where we left off yesterday? Ah. You're going to die with me, Jake? Uh, I don't think I feel up to it today, huh? Well, that's the way you want to be. Huh? Forget it. I get the message. From now on, I'm on my own. <laughs> I wanted to try to tell him that he wasn't. But the main reason for my staying aboard was Michelle, to watch him, to try to protect Hank. But there was a wall between my husband and myself now. A wall of gold that was stronger and more impervious than stone or steel. There was no way back, around, or over, or through it. Particularly when late that afternoon, Hank found the end of his private rainbow. The wreck of Lafitte's ship and his hoard of gold. It was all so sudden and unexpected that when it happened, I froze. It's sitting down there in 35 fathoms. Hank, you came up too fast. I do. The air was getting low, but I'm all right. But did you get the bend? Help me get off these tanks, Michelle. Oh, Monsieur. Oh, don't worry. I'm okay. I wasn't down deep long enough. And I'm going right back. No, Hank. Stop. What out? Michelle, get me the diver's gear. Read them all. Look, if you're worried about the pens, the best thing I can do is to get back down there. Why do you need to? I've got to tie off a float to mark the position. And I need conventional diver's gear to spend long enough down there to make sure of the goal. You didn't find that yet? Uh, the gear, monsieur. Okay. <laughs> Let me get into it. Uh, I didn't have time. I just made out the ship and I had to come up. How do you know uh, it's Lafitte? First, because it's approximately where the chart center would be. Second, even though it's a skeleton, not much more than stem, ribs, and a ghost of what was freeboard, from her silhouette, she looms like a barking scene. The kind of ship my feet sails. You're determined to go down? I've got to. There's just time before the light goes, and Michelle here will insist on putting it ashore. Will you stand by the pump of communication? Yes, thank you. Great. All right, give me the boots, Michelle. Go start the compressor. Oui, monsieur. Now, if I'm right, and there's gold there. I'll tie off a line and send up a balloon float. I'll just take hand tools down with me, but I may need an acetylene torch. Speaking of torches, you want the big submarine lamp. Yep, and I'll need a belt, too. Pressure's pretty heavy down there. Oh, come on, Jake. Don't look so gloomy. I am not gloomy. I am scared. I'm scared to death. Of what? I don't know, Hank. I only wish I did. Don't be silly. Now, give me my helmet. Here. You better take a good look at me. This may be the last time you see me. What do you mean? By the next time, I'll be a new man with my pockets lined with gold. I know Lady Luck has finally blessed me. Automatically, I gave the helmet the one eighth turn, secured the clamp, paid out enough lifeline and air pipe to help my husband clumsy and weighted down in the now unfamiliar element of air. Immediately, he sank down. Heading for the sea floor. I watched the windlasses unreal both the precious air pipe and the lifeline with the communication wire. Unwind. It seemed endlessly. And 
until it comes 33 fathoms, about 200 feet. They stopped turning, and I knew he was on the bottom. I put on my headset, and his voice floated up to me, eerily from the depths. Loud and clear. I'm down. Lucky to pass. I'm not 50 feet from the wreck. Heading for there now. Keep the line open. Wilco, how is it? Lucky. It's not to see clearly. I'm telling what's fine in the court. Not quick, isn't he? How can a man with as much knowledge and sense as you, Hank, be so stubborn and take such chances? Because I want to be king of the hell, baby, and this is my big chance. Would it mean anything if I said I'd just rather have the guy I married? I don't know, man. Oh, I think I'm going to have a good I don't read you. I'm a fellow. 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 Has Monsieur Levitt discovered anything? Uh, not yet. Not that I know of. I don't think you are telling me the truth. But why right have you got to question me? No, not yet. Excuse me, I'd better watch the pump. Hank, don't send up the balloon yet, please. Hank. Hank! But he had cut off the intercom. I couldn't reach him. I glanced quickly at Michelle. Was it just my own apprehension, or in the moment I looked his way, had he suddenly become completely concerned with the compressor? I wasn't taking any chances. I was already in my wetsuit. My face mask, I looped about my neck. I bent and slipped my fins on, pulling my tanks nearer to me. And the spear gun. And suddenly the balloon float surfaced. Has he found Lafitte's gold? Oh, maybe he's in trouble. Hank? Hank? Just here. Do you read me? Do you read me? Does he answer? No. And maybe the curse has caught up with him, too. But I think we better make sure. Turning in her surprise to look at Michelle, Jinx is horrified to see the sharp marine axe in his hands, poised above Hank's life and air pipelines, where they are stretched tight over the bulwark, the edge of the boat. It appears that all her worst fears are about to come true. I shall return shortly with Act Three. Two tenuous threads. One called the lifeline. The other even more important to life, the air pipe. Keep Hank Levitt alive on the sea floor. Above, on a boat that floats some 18 to 20 stories above him, his wife, Jinx, and the captain of the boat on whom Hank's life depends, face each other. Poised in Captain Michelle's hand is a sharp axe, which in one swift chop could sever all communication with the diver. Take his life. What are you going to do, Michelle? Since your husband has found the gold, what I must... No, wait. Wait. If you want the gold, it's yours. I can promise you in my husband's name. You cannot do that. Believe me, we'll give it all to you. I do not want the gold. All I want is peace and rest. As you do. I don't understand. Oh, well, you do. You just don't want to. We both want to cut clean with the past. The only difference is that you do not have the courage. Well, I do. No! You cut his line. Of course. Don't you understand yes to that? No, no. If he steals the gold, if he brings back into the world all the suffering, the brutality, the evil, and the curse that rides with it, it's like opening Pandora's books again. Lafitte is gold, and your husband must die. I won't let you do this. Don't make me kill you. Put away that gun. You can't leave Hank to die. I can do what must be done for the greatest good. Gold is a pestilence, a sickness that man can never control. Whoever spreads that sickness must die. I won't leave Hank to die. Then you must die too. At least by my own hand. Not yours. 
like an old-fashioned cannon. But knifing into the water, I was too busy with my impossible search for Hank. And then, a miracle. A cab crossed, and I realized Hank was using his emergency pack to breathe. We surfaced together to find that night had fallen. Phew! Oh! I thought I was a goner. I thought oh. we both were. Well, it's a marker. We haven't lost it. <laughs> Hank, is that all that matters? Oh, I found the free gold. I'm not going to lose it now. The first thing is to stay alive. Wait the boat. I don't know. When I went over it, there was a sound like an explosion. Well, let's try to orient ourselves. The moon is coming up. Now, let's see. The moon appears to be black against the horizon. Look for it. I'm looking. We'd better find it. Because if the boat is gone, we'd never make the main island. And if we have to... What is it? Look! A full rig ship. Could, could that be the barking Oh, but now sails are mad. Who can tell? I only see the ruins of a hull. Could that be the hull you saw? Yes. And it's the ghost ship. Ghost ship or not, if we want to save our neck, we'd better give it a hail. Help! Help! We're off your starboard bow! Can you help us? Up on the Where, where are you? Are you crazy? You want to drown? It might be better than answering that hail. Why? You listen to it. And have to be yourself. That's no human voice. It sounds as though it was echoing from... from the case itself. This is Captain Exhausted by that last desperate race for the surface. In a dream, we floundered towards the ship that offered some kind of sanctuary. And the nearer we got, it became more and more unreal. The hull was a hollow skeleton, encrusted on its ribs by barnacles and sea creatures. Welcome aboard the Marie Sangwang. You are. Captain Henri Lafitte? You had the advantage of me, sir. You and your lady. Ah, permissive one. I am Henry Levitt, and this is my wife, Janet Levitt. What are we doing here? You ask me? Now you must forgive my wife. No. I have a question. May I have an answer? It is not easy to answer. What are you doing here, indeed? Since, in a sense, I am not here either. What, what does that mean? But surely you must realize, monsieur, what your wife has realized from the first. That I, this ship, we are all in limbo. For any given moment, we exist only by chance. And at any further moment, we could vanish like the spray from a wave. Then why are we here? You want my gold. I have no wish to try to steal it from you. Is that so? Search your heart and find the answer. But if you desire it enough, are you willing to pay in return? I'm not sure I understand. Allow me, if you will, to cite my own case. I, like you, was upset, possessed even, if you will, by its lure. I spent my life in search of it. I know. Do you indeed? Forget your history. Let me tell you of the end of my life. After my fortune was stolen from me in Galveston, Texas, I took again to the high seas. Piracy was not easy by then. The, what shall I say, the picking was small. But gradually I built a small fortune. With the same cannon. One of which may have blown your boat out of the water and into eternity a short while ago. I and my crew plundered many ships. And the gold you stowed in your holes was stained with innocent blood. You may not, Jomo. What else? But it is not a full card. Came what I thought was my luck. But I found was my curse. What? 
Suddenly, of course, on her flight to Spain was an old-fashioned galleon fleeing the end of civil war in Bolivia. We attacked and boarded her, happy to find her an easy prey. But at first disappointed that she carried a flock of priests and nuns, a poor lot. <laughs> but then came the glorious surprise. Her cargo. Ha! I have to laugh when I remember that priest and the head nun whom my mate, Bobby Ross, brought to me in the cabin. Uh, Capitan of the Monsignor Miser Lugos of the Spanish Mission of Bolivia. Um, because of the war, I am returning to Spain with my priests and nuns of the Order of Santa Maria del Gracia. Here is Sister Carmelita, who is the shepherd of our nuns. No. You have killed and hurt many of our people. C'est la vie, c'est la guerre. But we have no war with you. You you are French, no? Citizen of the world. But still, one of us. Now, what does that mean? You are a parrot. You don't want me to take all the gold your church has ordered and is trying to steal away back to Spain. The artifacts of the Lord are precious far beyond their worldly value. What you carry in the ship in gold crucifixes, altar pieces, carpets, doubloons, gold bars, and bullion, precious gems, and too many other things to enumerate is a king's ransom. Are you asking me to forego that? These things belong to the king of kings. Correction, Monsignor. They now belong to me. Oh, you would plunder the Lord's treasure. If it is made of gold, I would tear it from my mother's breast. Antichrist. I can... Call me what names you will. They cannot hurt me. As for your gold, it is mine. It belongs to no one else. Even this... Ah, a handsome goblet, Father. <laughs> Thank you for offering it to I me. don't offer it to you. Huh? I hold the host before your eyes. And as you desecrate it, I call on the church to excommunicate. Let me off. I have heard enough. Not yet. I am yours, Almighty Father. But for this Antichrist, I petition you in all your... Ah, uh, dear... Oh, you killed me. You talk too much. Hear this, El Capitan. You have brought a curse on your head. This curse that you will die before you ever reach safe harbor. And you will never rest again when this cold is yours through all time and forever. You will wander homeless. So, here is the moment of decision, monsieur. The gold is there. That does not change. Do you want it? I've been searching for it all my life. It is here to take if you want the responsibility. All my life. All my life. All my life. Whoa! Oh, I thought I was a gun. I thought we both were. Where's the market? We haven't lost it. Is that all that matters? I found Lafitte's gold. I'm not going to lose it now. This is the first thing to stay alive. Where's the boat? I don't see. Oh, stop. Oh, there it is. Right over there. By the time we both had swum to the boat and clambered aboard, we were so exhausted we just lay like a couple of gassed fish fighting for breath. Hank was the first to get to his feet. I was so half out that I came to abruptly with a sudden gasp of horror. Good Lord! What? What is Michelle with the spear from your spear gun for his throat? Is he dead? Yes. How? I must... I must have fired it to stop him from cutting your lifeline. He wanted to kill us both. Why? Oh, Hank. I don't know now. I don't remember what was a dream or what a truth. He said he wanted to let the ghost rest. But now I think what he really wanted was the ghost. Whatever it is comes back to that. It 
comes from evil doing. It carries its curse with it. Time to stop dreams and obsessions. Let's face the fact. All I ever wanted to do. In time, I should feel the same way. Michelle tried to kill me, both of us. If you killed him, it was in self-defense. To try to save you. Oh, what a fool I've been. Blind to where the real treasure is. I'm going to have to make one more dive. Oh, no. It's that silver gold. Not for long. While I go down and cut the market line, you burn the chart. When I come back, we'll bury Michelle at sea and let him and the phantom Captain Lafitte fight for its ownership. I want no part of it anymore. You mean that, Hank? With all my heart. My only treasure is you. I'm just waking up to that. And to a brave new life. Did Jinx and Hank step across that strange border between life and death and meet the shadows of the past? Has it struck you as odd that the name Hank Levitt, or Henry Levitt, is closely akin to Henri Lafitte? And in the silent reaches of the night, how often do we wonder about the crossroads all of us come to in the march down the road of life? Most of us turn one way or the other by accident. To some few, the choice is revealed. This time, to someone who chose the right turning. The sea between the main island and Monoceau moves evenly as it has for millennia. Unchanging, bearing no evidence of the buried fortune beneath its surface. Like Pontius Pilate, not all the laving of its currents and its tides will ever wash away the blood that stains the yellow gold 30 fathoms deep. But somehow, for whatever reason, the ghost ship no longer rides the night winds. And at the last, all have come to rest. Our cast included Mason Adams, Terry Keene, Sam Gray, and Court Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... <laughs>